Rejoice! The international break is over. We have Jimmy Conrad and special guest Tom Marshall as we give you a weekend preview. And my goodness, what a preview. Liverpool, Leicester City, Tottenham, Man City, Atletico Madrid against Barcelona. We have MLS playoffs and so much more. Stay right here because Que Golazo begins right now. Celebrate good times, Jimmy. I am so happy. The international break. Is <laughs> Jimmy Conrad is here. Oh, I've missed you, brother. The weekend previews here. How I'm are you? Not, I'm doing well. I wrote behind me on the sign for everybody that can see it that the international break is finally over. I'm on the same page with you, Luis. Uh, very excited to kind of move on from the international game and to talk about the club football, as they say, on the weekend. Some big matchups coming up, so I'm buzzing. Absolutely. And listen, like, international break, uh, yes, it was good to see the U.S. return. Yes, Jack Grealish proved some magic. But honestly, it's all about the domestic game. And <laughs> it is back. We will get into Jimmy's easy money in a second, but I'm giving you three games to really watch out for, to just highlight, to just DVR, to make sure that you have your alerts, your little, you know, bat signals alert to spidey senses on them. Atleti Barcelona, I think, is one. Liverpool, Leicester City is another one. And Inter Miami against Nashville, three really big games. But there's so much more. Jimmy, talk to me about easy money. People want to make some money. They want to put it in their bank account. What you got for us? Well, I'm here for you guys. I try to do what I can on William Hill. That's the, the sports book that we partner with here at CBS. And I've got a couple. Now, Tottenham versus Manchester City is a very tasty matchup. I feel like it's a little wide open. I'm not going to get into that, Jose Mourinho versus Pep Guardiola, because I know we're going to get into it in a little bit. I didn't bet that one because I feel like there's so many injuries there. I wanted to stay away from it. I do like, though, Liverpool to beat Leicester City. Both teams to score plus 210. Now, I know there's a lot of doom and gloom and, and dark clouds around Liverpool right now, given all the injuries they've had. That said, they still haven't lost since Virgil van Dyke has been injured. They figure out ways to win games. And I think they're going to figure out another way to do it here. I think they have a lot of quality. I and mean, yes, Mo Salah has that COVID test that he got going with Egypt, but they got this kid. I don't know if you heard of him before, Luis, uh, Diego Jota, pretty Ooh. good, apparently very good. And so he, uh, I think is going to fill in nicely for me to jump back into the team. I like both teams to score for sure. You got Jamie Vardy, on your side. I think he'll probably get a goal. So I like that one a lot. And then anytime you can get Leo Messi on the plus side, uh, that is awesome. So Leo Messi to score anytime versus Atletico Madrid plus 120, which I love because he has scored more goals against a Diego Simeone managed team than any other player in Diego Simeone's history. And Jan Oblak has given up more goals to only one player, and that is Leo Messi. So he has something when he plays against Atletico Madrid, no matter how hard it is. And I know Atleti's only given up two goals domestically this season, which is next level, and they've yet to lose in La Liga. I'm not saying that Leo Messi and Barcelona are going to win. I'm just going to say that Leo Messi is going to score and because he takes the free kicks, because he takes the penalties. I really like that value there. And then finally, Napoli and AC Milan to draw both teams to score plus 300. This one's, I feel like you can make an argument, Luis, about either one of them potentially winning. I feel like Milan used to be dominant in some games, and now they're dropping off a little bit. They've drawn two of their last three. You know, they had that 3-3 with Roma. Uh, and I think there's some vulnerability there. And I think Romanoli, their captain, is going to be out as well. And so him in the back line not being there, I think does make a difference. I think Napoli obviously have some talented players as well. I could see a 1-1. I could see a 2-2 in this. So I think both teams are going to score for sure. Plus 300 is, is my easy money on that. And I wish you guys the best of luck. I love it. And we're going to get right into it, right? Jimmy dove in, right? Thanks to William Hill, the partners over there uh, and the betting tips. So we're going to get even more analysis. Stay right here after these messages, because when we come back, we're going to break down the Premier League, La Liga, Serie A, and of course, Major League Soccer. Stay right here, because we're coming right back. Welcome back, everybody. We are now with Jimmy Conrad going to talk a little bit about some of these games, uh, dive right in, some analysis. Let's begin, Jimmy, in the Premier League. Tottenham, Manchester City. Jose Mourinho once again facing Pep Guardiola, who recently has signed a new contract with Manchester City. Um, you know, this is always going to be a good game. As I'm looking ahead here, you know, we talk about the holiday period, right? Such a busy period. Um, 
Tottenham's kind of begins right now because they also have to face Chelsea, Arsenal, and Liverpool. You know, in the next uh, out of the next three out of their four matches. You know, after City, and for City, this is a good time to build some momentum. I think Sergio Aguero might come back. We'll see. Matt Doherty, by the way, from Tottenham standpoint, uh, got a positive COVID test when he was facing uh, when he was with Ireland. There's a lot to talk about in this game. Give me some analysis here. Ton and Manchester City, it's always a good one with two big managing personalities face each other. What do you see? Well, what I see is kind of a role reversal because in some ways, the goals are being scored by a Jose Mourinho team this season and the goals are not being scored as much or as frequently by Pep Guardiola team. So that's pretty interesting. Right now, Spurs sit five points above City in the table, though City have a game in hand. This is a six-point swing. Right, because if Spurs can win this, that gap between these two clubs is eight points. But if City win, then it's two points. So, and to your point about the schedule, I mean, that's crazy that Spurs have City now, then Chelsea, then Arsenal, then Liverpool in their next four games. I mean, the schedule makers did them dirty, Luis. Absolutely did them dirty. And any any uh, complaining from Jose Mourinho for me is quite warranted, uh, given that type of schedule. I feel like Spurs, knowing that they have these four tough games coming up going to have to really throw everything at it in this first one to really try to, you know, put their foot right coming out of an international break and, and getting after it. Now, uh, with regard to what I was saying before, Mourinho's teams have scored twice as many. I think that's, and they had more shots on goal, creating more shots. Like everything is in Spurs' favor right now. The problem is Hingman's son had to get a charter back from his uh, international break. Is he going to pass the COVID test? There's a lot of question marks. And then on City's side, you say Sergio Aguero. I see reports that he's going to play. Fernandinho's back in. But then I see on other sites, I don't know if they're going to play or not. Raheem Sterling, I don't know if he's going to play or not, even though he looks like he's he's tipped to start. There's a lot of unknown in this one, which is why I was staying away from it from a betting perspective, because it does really impact, obviously, if Sterling's playing as opposed to... I feel Foden's been good, of course, but but anyway. So one of the lines that I really like is Harry Kane to score a header plus 1,000. Why not throw a flyer on that and see what happens? Or to him to get an assist. He leads the whole Premier League with 10 assists plus 300. I like that one. I'm looking that one at that one a lot from a Spurs perspective. This is This is a great game. In a lot of different ways, I think it's two managers that respect each other, but also like like to get at each other's throats a little bit and try to one up the other. So I like that there's a little sauce on it, both on and off the field. Uh, what are you thinking? What's your big matchup here? Because I know that when you said Matt Doherty's going out, Serge Awi, I think, is going to step in. And now he's going to maybe get a chance, if he plays well, to continue to be in the lineup more consistently. So he's got some motivation. And I, I like this game in a lot of different ways. Yeah, you know what? Uh, perfect analysis. And to be honest, Sergio Rear is not exactly a bad replacement, right? He knows exactly what to do in, in these situations. Listen, I'll just say this because you added so much great context here. I'll just say this. When I look at the table, Tottenham, because uh, they're only a point as we speak, right? They're only, they're only a point behind Leicester City in the table. All the talk, all the conversation, all the rhetoric, rhetoric that Jose Mourinho continues to have for Spurs, has always been, you know, we have this squad, we have the confidence, you know, let's take over. You know, this is now the time to put, right, your money where your mouth is. This is now the time to beat Man City, to take advantage of a Man City who's below you in the table, to actually finally say, this is why you brought me to Tottenham. I've got Harry Kane doing well. I've got the team collectively working well. It doesn't matter if Sergio Aguero maybe returns. It doesn't matter if Sterling comes in. We have a squad good enough to beat them. So to me, this is really about Jose Mourinho to putting his money back where his mouth is and saying like, listen, we are Spurs and we're back. And what better way to do that than against Manchester City. And this exact fixture last season, they did that. They won 2 nothing, But like you said, it's still going to be a different kettle of fish just because Man City wants to come back up that table. But for me, the narrative is this. Really, Jose, you're here with Tottenham. Well, time to prove that you can do it and you can win, finally, the Premier League title with, uh, with Spurs. Uh, you're spot on. I, I think that this is a game that Spurs have to win if they really want to be considered as a title contender. They have to do it. On the flip side, both of them are playing well, by the way. They're both coming into this uh, unbeaten. And I think I think uh, Spurs is seven and, and Cities is five. So, you know, they're coming in. But that international break is a little bit different. I do want to throw in, though, that we have three consecutive weeks of Champions League and Europa League, which is going to make a difference. Where I think Spurs is in a decent spot is that they got Ludogorets at home right after this one. And then uh, they got Lask, which is going to be a trip. But then they, they welcome Royal Antwerp on the way back. Um, but then, you like all the games that we just mentioned, they play Chelsea. They play, uh, you know, or excuse me, Arsenal. Like that, those are tough. And Liverpool, those are tough, tough games. And so 
yeah, this is going to be a, a really interesting stretch. If they can survive this, and yes, I think they're in a good position. But if can, I, I really another one too, and I think we should talk about this. If Hingman Son can't can't play for whatever reason, at some point Gareth Bale has to emerge as somebody that they can rely on in a really meaningful way. He seems like he's somewhat more engaged than he was at Madrid. Of course, you know he's not looking through his eye, you know his hands through with binoculars out on the sideline, but. You know, he still seems a little bit off of it. And I wonder if they can get him to kick on because he's going to be so valuable to them if they're going to really push on and, and help hopefully win the league. City's perspective, you know, even though Nathan Ake, you know, unfortunately got a COVID test when he was on international break, they still have Laporte and Diaz, which I think is their best center back pairing moving forward. For me, it's just who's going to be up front. Obviously, Jesus and Foden and Ferran Torres obviously scored a bunch of goals for Spain in the international break. So they've got some young, exciting players there. But nothing can compare to having Sterling and Aguero up top instead. So there's a lot of question marks. This is going to be a tremendous game. If you're going to make time for any game this weekend, and hopefully you make some time for a bunch of them because we have a lot to talk about. Uh, this is one for sure I'm circling on my calendar. Yeah, you made a really good point about Gareth Bale. Uh, and he was taken off uh, early against Wales' game against Finland. And, and that should keep Jose Mourinho happy because he did look sharp in that game. So this is, could, be, could be the proper welcoming addition to that game and Gareth Bale. Let's move on because we, you did bring it up in uh, in your easy money. This is another big game. The biggest, to be honest, because Leicester City is leading the table right now. Liverpool against Leicester City. So much talent and also a perfect contrast of strategy. Jurgen Klopp against Brendan Rodgers. I wouldn't say so much that Brendan Rodgers, Jimmy, is you know necessarily like a heavily obsessed person on possession. It's more about using the spaces wisely. And again, even though Mohamed Salah obviously uh, you know affected with 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 the COVID issue, like you said, Diogo Jota, you know um, Firmino, uh, Sadio Mane, there's still too much talent. But then on the other side, Jamie Vardy against a very vulnerable center back situation in Liverpool. They're playing at Anfield. It's on Sunday, 2.15 Eastern. How do you see this? Yeah, this is, I think you can make a really strong case for Leicester. I, I really do. I just lean on the fact about how much of a fortress Anfield has become for Liverpool. And even if things aren't going right for them, they still figure out a way to pull some magic out of their butt. I think that's probably the best way I can say it. Uh, even though Brendan Rodgers and his incredibly big giant white teeth are going to want to come in there and, and uh, you know, and, and show up Mr. Uh, Firmino, who I think is the player with the best big giant white teeth in the game. Uh, that's my bad, bad joke. I think that there's, there's going to be some action here. And I'm looking at the stats now. Uh, they're Liverpool are without a clean sheet in each of their last six at Anfield. So I think Jamie Vardy, to your point, is a good guy to score. I've got some other lines here. If you want Vardy to score, both teams to score and Liverpool to win, which I think could potentially happen. That's plus 450. As I mentioned, my easy money. I think Liverpool will find a way to win this. When I look at the potential lineup, yeah, we say, oh, they've got some injuries. They've got some possibilities that somebody's going to be out. I mean, you still got Robertson. Trent Alexander-Arnold, I think, is, is a little bit of a question mark. But then you got Vinaldum, Henderson, and Milner in midfield. So you got a hardworking crew there who have some energy, right? They're not getting called in as much. Well, some of them are. But but they're not, um, you know, maybe they're, they're, they're rotating a lot more, I think, in that area of the field. And then you have Mane, Firmino, and then Jota. Like, that's a serious front three. And I, even though I like a lot of the young players on Leicester, Fofana stands out for me. And then you got uh, James Justin as well. They're still young. And then you got Johnny Evans and, and Fuchs in, in, in the middle. I think they can be run at. I think they're going to be goals in this one. And it might end up coming down to this. It might be crazy to say, Luis, which goalkeeper is having a better day? Is it going to be Allison or is it going to be Casper Schmeichel? Yeah, it could be a set piece decider, right? It really could, could be. Some, yeah, it really could. I, I look at this game as well. And by the way, Leicester, you know, Castagna's out with a thigh injury. Fofan is out with a knee injury. Pereira is out with a knee injury. So they have their issues of themselves. But again, I know it's a little lazy, I guess, but I get, I repeat the same thing what I said about Jose Mourinho and Tottenham. I bring it right here. Leicester City, we remember last season, we're doing the same kind of trajectory leading up to Christmas period. They were doing well, they were leading up the table, and then obviously the games uh, overwhelmed them, and 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 obviously the fixture uh, situation with certain matches overwhelmed them, and they ended up not, you know, doing as well as they wanted to, which was obviously a Champions League spot. They are in a similar situation. And these, again, are the kind of matches that say, you know, when you look back when you're in April or May, man, if we could have just won that game, this is another one. To win away at Liverpool, regardless of the personnel, 
is another statement that could be for Leicester City and maintain that number one spot. And I think I echo your point. This might be decided by your dead ball situations as opposed to what happens in, uh, you know, on the field from a live action perspective. Yeah, it just it may be more for Allison than it is for Casper Schmeichel and goal. But if Allison is standing on his head and making these wonder saves, which we know both goalkeepers are capable of, that could end up proving the difference as well. And Allison, if he can control his box and keep his back line a little steady in front of him, because they obviously aren't playing together a lot right now. We don't really know who their back four is going to be. That will make a big difference. I am looking, though, and I've looked at this for most of the clubs. We just had an international break about a month ago, right? So who came out of the last international break playing well? Since that time, Everton, well, Liverpool was 2-2. And that, if you guys remember that game, that's where Virgil van Dijk got, got hurt. They won five straight from that. And then they had a draw against Manchester City, obviously a very formidable opponent when they were away from home. A very, I think, pretty good result, all things considered. They've been playing pretty well. And I think they've become very pragmatic in the way that they play. They can't be maybe... Reckless seems pretty harsh to, when you talk about Liverpool because it seems like there's so much thought in how they move. But now I feel like they're even being more efficient with let's not take as much risk because our back line is maybe, maybe let's not play as high. Let's try to maybe press 10, 15 yards deeper and see what happens. Now they're picking their spots, I think, as opposed to maybe being like run and gun. Like, oh, if they get one, it's okay, we'll score four. You know, so uh, I think they've been a, a little bit more cautious and I think it's helped them actually in a lot of different ways. And, and now here's another good line for you for everybody that likes Liverpool. Diego Jota, Sadio Mane to score anytime plus 115. I like that a lot. I think either one of those guys could potentially do it, maybe both. And I think Firmino is going to be a guy that might be dropping some assists if you want to go find that line as well. I don't know that number off the top of my head. This is another one, though, to your point, Luis, is going to be a fantastic game. And I'm sure Brendan Rodgers, the manager of Leicester, former Liverpool uh, manager who was one slip away from Stevie Gerrard from potentially winning that first title in so many years. Uh, you know, obviously he's going to have some revenge in his mind, whether he says otherwise. I don't believe him. <laughs> Two caveats, by the way. Kasper Schmeichel was taken off in the Dan uh, for Denmark with a possible head collision. So I, we don't know yet. He says he felt Is good. He, mark? Okay. he said he felt good in the morning after. Uh, as you were talking, I was reading for the update. So as we speak, we, you know, we are not a hundred percent sure on that situation. And Jordan Henderson, too, by the way, with a groin injury possible. But Regardless, the people that you mentioned, Jota, of course, Jamie Vardy, those are the real game deciders. And those are the ones that might give three points for either Klopp or Brendan Rodgers. Let's stay in the Premier League because there's some real tasty matches everywhere, my man. So many, mm -hmm. right? Um, and another one to look at is Leeds against Arsenal. I don't know if you remember this one, obviously, last season in the Cup, but it was so much fun to watch. Um, again, another contrasting matchup in terms of philosophy, Mikel Arteta against Marcelo Bielsa. Um, what do you have here? This is, this could be a good one too. Yeah. For me, it's kind of like the straight up odds. I was trying to look at this one and, and find, you know, a little bit more in depth. I mean, if you have a top goal scorer that you think is going to hit the back of the net, you, I mean, mm -hmm. Obama Yang's usually a good one, but he's in the minus for scoring anytime. If you like him at the first goal score, it obviously jumps up a little bit. What I was going to say is I'm going to, I'm trying to find it right here is uh, leads to win straight up at plus 220 is not bad. And Arsenal to win straight up at plus 117 isn't bad. I don't really see a draw on this. Arsenal have yet to have a draw this season, four wins, four losses. They're kind of an either or team. There's something about this Leeds team though. They've given up eight goals in their last two games coming out of the last international break. They've only won one out of four, no draws either. They just, there's just, are they already worn out from Bielsa? Are they already kind of their quality already showing? They had that one kind of blip almost. I call it an anomaly now, given how well Aston Villa's kind of responded to them getting beat by Leeds 3-0, where Bamford just scored. He's decided to be messy uh, this game and scored three fantastic goals against Villa. But but then Villa stomped on Arsenal 3-0, you know, not too long ago. So, or the, the last match. So it's, it's interesting coming into this one. Obviously, top managers, very, very smart and bright guys are going to have their teams ready to go and prepared. I just wonder, coming out of the break, who's going to have the advantage? I get the sense that Arsenal is. So I kind of like Arsenal to win this one straight up at plus 117, frankly. Leeds, I don't know, man. They're so hit and miss. And, and I think that Arsenal have, have the strength. I know we could sit here and make fun of them. And, and it's an easy joke. Low-hanging fruit to make fun of Arsenal. But I, I think that uh, Arteta is going to have these guys ready to go. And, and to lean on what you said, they beat – leads in the cup last year, one zero with very similar squads, right? The core of the teams are pretty much the same. That's a pretty tight scoreline for two teams that like to attack and get after it. So uh, we'll see if that's the same, but, but I kind of like uh, a straight up bet in this one, depending on, how, on who you support, I suppose. Yeah. The one thing that I will echo uh, from that, uh, and I'll just add this to this picture is that, um, you know, 
there will, there will be goals in this. <laughs> there will be goals in this. Because I think all you need to know about Leeds at this point is 15th on the table. And, you know, they've scored 14 goals. Very good. Mm-hmm. Very good. But they have the joint worst defensive record with 17 goals conceded. And when you look at, uh, you know, when they face teams that are usually collectively smart, like Arsenal, it, it it might be a problem for them, but this season is so weird, man. I don't, I don't, I, all, I can, all I can guarantee you right now is that I, 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 I'm almost certain that there will be goals in this, just like you said. Well, I just want to bring up too, because I kind of threw some shade at, at Leeds for only winning three out of four league games since uh, the, the last international break. Arsenal's, <laughs> Arsenal's in the same boat. Yeah. They lost to Manchester City coming out of the last international break, 1-0. They lost to Leicester at home, 1-0, coming out right after that. And then they uh, they beat Manchester United 1-0, which was a tough, you know, big game for them. And then they ended up, like, it kind of just threw those points back in after getting smoked by Aston Villa 3-0. So, again, kind of a Jekyll and Hyde type team here. But the schedule has been pretty unrelenting. I mean, those are some very tough opponents, especially when you're catching Villa now, when they're playing at the peak of probably their season. No disrespect. Yeah, I, don't, I, I, I hope Villa continues to keep it up, Luis. But... But uh, at some point, I think they're going to drop off a bit. And then after this game, they, they play Wolves, which is never an easy game. And then they got, they got Spurs, you know, so the game, the season, the, the schedule doesn't really ease up for them. So, uh, and then they have all the European stuff too, that they have to manage as well. Thankfully they have somewhat of a manageable group. Uh, you know, if they can't get past Dundalk in the Europa League, then they've got bigger questions to answer. Absolutely. Stay right here, guys, because right after this very, very quick hit, we will be back with La Liga and a really, really big game. Welcome back, everybody. Listen, I told you that I'm excited because uh, Jimmy and I are going to break down this amazing, uh, you know, weekend round of matches. We are now in Spain. And my God, what a game. Atletico Madrid against Barcelona. Jimmy, your Atletico Madrid without Luis Suarez, who tested positive for COVID-19. But still a very, very tasty matchup with a lot of talent from both sides. What do you see here? Can Diego Simeone finally get this done? So my big sadness, if can I say that sadness about this game is that Luis yeah. Suarez will not be available for Atletico Madrid. He doesn't have a chance oh. to take a swipe at a club that it's you know, so 2020, and, isn't it? Uh, for like it just the, 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 the football gods to be like, oh, you wanted the former Barcelona player, one of the best strikers that the club has ever had now Atletico to face Barcelona? Nah. You know, I just wanted Luis Suarez to take a bite out of Barcelona, you know, and uh, and really get some revenge. Obviously, most relationships, I think, when you become an aging player with with clubs don't end uh, as, as romantic as you think. It's usually acrimonious and, and everybody's upset in some ways and it's just easier to break it off and everybody go on to new pastures. I still don't mind the fact that Suarez left Barcelona. I think as they kind of work through this transition, it'll end up being a better thing for them, but it really helped at Letzi on the flip side. He has not necessarily like a Zlatan-esque, you know, swagger to him, but he does have this confidence that I think at Letzi we're missing. And I think because of his mere presence on the field, that's opened up space for other players to emerge, most notably Joao Felix, who has been on fire this season and really kind of matching the potential that we all kind of knew that he had and he showed at Benfica. And I just think moving over to Atleti to a team and a manager that likes to play a little bit defensive, maybe handcuffed him in a way that he couldn't play in the same way that we know. But now it's starting to open up a little bit. And when I look at what Diego Simeone is doing, I think he learned a little bit from getting outmanaged, frankly, by RB Leipzig in the Champions League last season where they were so defensive at home and they have these horses in their team and they left Marat on the bench. They left Felix on the bench. And I was like, what is he doing? You're at home. Like you got to take the game to these guys. You can't just sit back and hope you can hit them on a set piece or hope that Jan Oblak's going to make 15,000 saves, but they have changed. And I feel like the emergence of uh, Angel Correa in particular, he's going inside a little bit more. That's allowing Trippier to kind of be a little bit more of the width guy. Correa doesn't have to hold on to the sideline. He can go into the middle and combine a little bit. Llorente is another guy that does the same. Carrasco can come in. Koke and Saul can potentially hold. And they got Condogbia as well. Like they've got some options now that's going to make them a little bit more box to box in midfield, a little bit more looking for those combination plays. So I'm, I'm, I'm high on Atleti right now. And I, yes, I know I support them. So I'm excited to see. I mean, they've scored nine goals in the last three home games. That is like unprecedented under Diego Simeone. They've scored 17 goals in La Liga. They haven't given up, uh, they've only given up two, excuse me, and they're the only team that have yet to lose in the league. There's something about them this season that I really like, and I think they're in a good run of form. However, Barcelona does seem to have, Leo Messi in particular, have their number. 
And so we'll see uh, which version of Barcelona comes out. And to speak about them, Luis, because I want to throw it to you about this. Leo Messi landed from Argentina and had to answer questions right when he got off the plane. He, he came out and said, I'm tired of being the problem of everybody's issues, whether it's at the club. And I think he's probably referencing Antoine Griezmann. You know, it, it's, I think I like when Messi's pissed. I like I, when, when, when Messi's pissed, that dude shows up and plays at another level. He's so focused. I think he'll be up for this one in particular. He seems to have good games against Atleti. So, so we'll see. I mean, my bet, as I said before, the easy money was Messi scoring anytime plus 120. I think that's fantastic value. But, but I don't know what you think about Barcelona because they're still a little bit all over the place in terms of their identity, I think, this season. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not completely sold on the Barcelona train, especially, you know, w- with this kind of season. Let me just uh, hit on that part about Messi. He just, listen, he just had like a 15-hour flight, like just played in like the most ridiculous fixture against Peru that was trying so hard, like <laughs> Conmebol South American World Cup qualifiers. Mm-hmm. He lands... He, you know, I'm sure it was an, like a comfortable fly, but it's still 15 hours nonetheless, right? He arrives in Barcelona. He's got to go through customs and all that stuff. And then you see this sea of people on the first thing that they're like, what do you think about it? Like, <laughs> leave him alone. I'm actually, I tip my hat off because like the way that he responded, you know, what to your point about, you know, I'm tired of being, you know, the excuse for everybody or whatever. He didn't like yell or whatever. Like if I was him, I would have been like, get out of my way. I'm trying to get into the card. You know what I mean? So yeah. just leave him alone. But let's go back to this game. Let me just give you a few pointers here. OK, Simeone Saltatico Madrid has played Barcelona 17 times, 11 losses, six draws, goal scored 13. They've conceded 27. Atleti have kept a clean sheet once. I know that it's a new day or whatever, but it's, let me just paint the picture, okay? The most common scoreline is probably like a 2-1, right? Simeone has never beaten Barcelona, okay, with Atletico Madrid, all right? Messi has 15 goals or assists across this Barcelona journey, okay? So he has the best of Atleti. Having said all that, I think this is the game where they win. I think this is the game where Atletico Madrid wins, and I'll tell you why. I think that finally, finally, Simeone has figured out that not only is it about pressing Barcelona and trying to intoxicate them because that's just not going to work, but it's about utilizing what you have. I think Luis Suarez not being available is a tremendous problem. And and to be honest with you, my predictions with Atleti have never been correct, so I'll probably just jinx them. But I think that this is the moment and I feel like this is the narrative for this episode. This is the moment for Joao Felix to be like, I'm the future. I'm the present and I'm here. And don't worry, Luis Suarez or not, we'll take care of it. And hopefully what we'll see is a tremendous game where Atleti takes advantage of all these issues that you just talked about with Barca, capitalize on them. Don't just rely on the physical. Don't just rely on the high press, but on good things, especially when you have the ball. And let Joao Felix just do his magic. And hopefully, hopefully we will see a great game because the Joao Felix of last season, right, is gone. This is a a, a, a 2.0 Joao Felix. And I feel that that could be a major part. But maybe I jinxed them and maybe Barcelona just wins 3 nothing, And then it's... <laughs> well, that's... You never know. I mean, this Barcelona team, we saw know. them stomp on Villarreal the first game of the season 4-0. And you're like, all right, you know, maybe these guys are going to be a little bit different. Yeah. I don't know. Coming out of an international break, trying to get on the same page with some of your guys, you know, in, in obviously long flights, as you mentioned, with the, the guys that come from South America, it, it's a lot. And and that relationship with Griezmann, I think there's there's a little bit of grift there, man, between those two guys. I think it's been evident. They don't really pass and look for each other all that much. Maybe that's changing. But um, I'm curious to see where Messi sets up. I'm kind of looking at the projected lineups. There's still no like drop off. Ter Stegen being in goal for Barcelona is a big upgrade over some of the over Neto who was in before, who just gives up a lot of kind of trash goals. And so Ter Stegen is going to make a big difference. And and I think right there with Oblak is one of the best world's best. This is a tough one though. This is such a tough game. Jimmy, we forgot to mention no Ansu Fati here. No Sergio Busquets here. Like you know, like um, I know they have talent, but. It's there for the taking. It is. It really is. And so, listen, if you want Atletico to win straight up, it's plus 190. If you're feeling Barcelona to do it, it's plus 140. I mean, again, we could probably make a narrative either way for you guys. But if you're feeling something deep down in your heart, that's pretty good value on William Hill if you want to check that out. Yeah. All right. Let's finish up with uh, a good one in Italy. Uh, Serie A. Napoli against AC Milan. What you got, Jimmy? 
Well, I like this game a lot because, and let's hold on. I got some fun stats for you that I want to throw your way before we get started. So in yeah, 12- Yeah, well, of, ask you, yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. If you're ready, go ahead. No, I was going to say in 12, in, in 12 of Napoli's last 16 home matches in Serie A, both teams have scored. I've already said to you guys that I think both teams are going to score. I like them to draw. I think it's going to be plus, plus 300 for that. Um, also, Napoli have managed to win by two, two, over two goals in five of their last 10 games. So, and they got, uh, you know, Victor Osiman up top, who I think is a fantastic player. And I think he's going to be leading Nigeria to a lot of glory, hopefully in the African Cup of Nations moving forward. I just However, got him on FIFA 21. Like, so good, so huh? good for me. <laughs> oh, it's unbelievable. But Milan's, have, you know, they, they have 19 consecutive games in Serie A with no losses. I think them getting smacked around by Lille 3-0 in, in the Champions League is going to wake them up a little bit with regard to, hey, we got to still bring it. But without Romanoli, uh, I, I find that going to be a little bit more difficult for their back line. And Milan have only won one of their last 20 encounters with Napoli in Serie A. So that's something to consider as well. So those are some stats, you know, obviously shape our narrative and shape kind of how we're seeing this game. But we look at current form, you know, if Zlatan's healthy, you know, that's always gives, it always gives your team a chance. You, your team could be absolute junk, but if you got Zlatan on your team, you always have a chance. And the, having those types of players, and I think we were referencing it with Luis Suarez, it, it makes a difference because these guys can change a game with one play, with one, with one moment of brilliance, right? And that obviously changes the confidence that your team has to go on and get a result. Uh, I like this game. Well, this is another one I'm circling on my calendar. You know, obviously we have a lot of talented players, a lot of up and coming players in this one as well. And, and I'm excited to see how both managers do, especially Gennaro Gattuso. Well, I was going to say, Napoli. Yeah. yeah, there's some romantic uh, narrative here. Obviously, Gennaro Gattuso, a Nancy Milan legend facing, uh, you know, his a side that he knows too well. By the way, as you're talking, and this is why, guys, we want you to make sure that when you listen to this, keep up to date with the latest. Because as we're talking, like, you know, uh, Osman like dislocated his right shoulder while international yeah, duty yeah. in Nigeria. We don't know yet if he will be on maybe he will be, but something to keep eye. Also, I remember David Ospina did not play for Colombia um, when they got killed by Ecuador uh, due to a muscle problem as well. Uh, so he will be assessed. Uh, on the other side, Bakayoko isn't at his best after suffering a, a really tough flu. Uh, you know, situation. So there's a few things to watch out for from both sides. But regardless, this is a good game um, and will be super intriguing to see what happens in it. We take one more break and then we bring it right home to MLS. Welcome, everybody. Jimmy Conrad and yours truly. We told you that it'll be a great weekend preview. We got one more thing with Jimmy to talk about, and it's a league, of course, that he knows too well. Major League Soccer, man. I'm so, you know, I just wrote a thing about it for CBS Sports. Uh, you know, we need to give a lot of credit to MLS, just everything that I've gone through. And now finally we're here in the playoffs. You know, we had a bubble tournament, regular season in the respective markets, and now the playoffs begin. And let's talk about them. And let's focus specifically on the playing games. Uh, obviously, Montreal, New England on one side, but let's really talk about two inaugural seasons or two brand new teams in the league. They face each other in the playoffs. Nashville hosting Inter Miami. What you got? I, I love that game in particular. Obviously, as you said, both teams have just entered into the league. Inter Miami kind of squeaking in here as the number 10 seed to get into the playoffs. Uh, David Beckham is uh, one of the, the owners, so that makes it all fancy and glitzy, as does the team just being in Miami in particular. Obviously, they've they had to weather their own storm, you know, to, to, to borrow that cliche that everybody seems to use when there's adversity uh, brewing. But obviously, you know, they wanted to open up a new stadium. COVID hit. You know, they had all these things going. COVID hit. Now, I know a lot of clubs can say the same thing. It just felt like Nashville is a little bit more as a first-year team, had a little bit more of their stuff going and already in place. So it's been an interesting transition year for a lot of teams, but for the expansion teams, it's like, yeah, could this be the worst year ever to start? However, they find themselves in the playoffs into Miami, even though they were struggling a little bit, I like Rodolfo Pizarro, but they added Blaze Matuidi and Gonzalo Iguain. Now Iguain's only scored one in nine games for them, but his, his stats in terms of how he's creating shots, I think he's second in the league in creating shots and shots on goal since joining up so he's getting opportunities just a matter whether he can finish them we know that he's got the quality to do so big article about him recently just loving his time and getting a break from the 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 non-stop like adversity and like speculation and gossip of, of playing in these big leagues and now that he's with his brother who's joined him now from dc united who's played in the league for eight years 
you can just tell the guy just loving being in Miami and playing for the club. So I think that love could come across and obviously that quality. However, Walker Zimmerman, Nashville, just got named as the MLS Defender of the Year. We'll see if he can get uh, Iguain out in his back pocket uh, throughout this game. Nashville has been one of the best defensive teams in the league this season. So it was a well-deserved award for Walker, who's been kind of the face of that back four. I like Nashville in this one. I think if uh, the playoffs were normal, they would have been one of the, they're the number seven seeds that so they would have gotten in and they've extended this. So this is a good play in game. Obviously the new England revolution, Bruce Serena taking on Thierry Henry's Montreal impact is going to be a good one. There's the Jimmy Conrad Derby sporting Kansas city, both my former club there taking on the San Jose earthquakes, my other former club. I'm excited to watch that one. Orlando city with Nani and, and Oscar Perea has been awesome to watch taking on NYCFC who are also, I mean, there's just so many great games. Uh, I'm excited to crew New York Red Bull. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. So if you're going to spend some time, and I really encourage you to do so, go support your local team if you're here domestically. If you're trying to find a, a team in MLS, reach out to us on Twitter or whatever it is. We'll tell you if you support, let's say, Liverpool, which team is like that in MLS so you have somebody to cheer for. It's a lot of fun to do so, and I think you will appreciate the league in a much different way if you do. Yeah, very well done. The only thing that I'll add is that Inter Miami Nashville is basically what you said. I think it's you know the best sense of collective defense right they only conceded 22 goals mainly thanks to the defender of the year uh Zimmerman against you know an inter Miami side who has yet to play them with Gonzalo Higuain so that yeah. to me is a super uh, we I actually we had Gary Smith on the show uh this week and he's a very you know and he forgives you I think <laughs> <laughs> did you bring it up no, no, I didn't. Oh, okay. even care. He's fine, though. He's a very he's you know what? Like when we were talking about the, the game and everything, the thing to him was just like, even when I said, listen, home advantage is a big thing and it's been working for you. What do you see? And he says, honestly, this is about how we control the game when we don't have the ball. Right. And as long as we're fine and collected, everything is fine. They have a lot of firepower into Miami. And to be honest, Diego Alonso's side can can be kind of like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get, especially when you have so much firepower. But at the same time, as they showed early in the season, a lot of vulnerability. So it'll be a really, really good one. But to your point, so many great games to look out for. LAFC Seattle Sanders is one as well that I'm looking uh, I'm excited to watch out. But Welcome, MLS players. We're excited to have you. Anything else to add for that or anything else, Jimmy, as we say goodbye to you? And what a great loaded episode. I'm so excited. No, I just highly encourage everybody to watch some games this weekend. You know, I know we've been kind of hemming and hawing and talking and chewing our teeth about uh, the international break. Obviously, that's important and will have implications moving forward. And we'll get into that. But I just love this time of year in particular. A lot of games, a lot of great matchups and and uh, yeah, this is going to be a great, I don't know if I'm going to leave my couch is what I'm trying to say, Luis. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with you, brother. Jimmy Conrad, always good to have you. You will have Jimmy back when we recap the entire thing later on this week. Jimmy, always good to have you. Enjoy the games, brother. Thanks, dude. You too. Welcome back, everybody, to Que Golazo. And to wrap up this amazing weekend preview, we say hello to my friend, the amazing, the expert, the genius, the legend, Tom Marshall. Tommy, how are you, bud? Yeah, I'm good, Luis Miguel. A bit flattered there by, by those words going red over here. But um, <laughs> but yeah, no, no, I'm fine. Thanks. Looking forward to, to the Ligia. And yeah, I mean, I don't know. It's kind of a shame that there's no fans, you know, and I'm not going to be able to go to the game. But at the same time, I think we've just got to be grateful that, the, you know, the there are games and, and you know league round x is is here and we're gonna have a we're gonna have a champion in a matter of a few weeks absolutely and uh listen tom like i could have gone on and on to to give you an intro uh for those who don't know tom marshall aside from knowing all the good things uh about soccer he is an expert in liga mx and mexican soccer he's here to talk about it as liguilla the Mexican League's playoffs begin. Just a little, you know, recap. Leon won the regular season with Puma second, Club America third, Cruz Azul in fourth. And there's been a few changes just because of COVID-19. So before we begin, Tom, want to, uh, and talk about Liguilla, talk to us about, uh, about the format because it changed a little bit as we moved into the postseason. How did that work for COVID-19 season in 2020? Yeah, no, it's been really interesting because I think we've seen leagues all over the world kind of have that conversation about, you know, what we're going to do, how we're going to deal with this. And I mean, Liga MX, you know, over a third of the players have been tested positive. You know, the male first team players, I think there's 452 registered and it's like there's now over 150 cases. So it has been really serious, but you just kind of rolled through it. 
Um, but what's 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 really interesting is that that going back until the you know the first couple of months of the pandemic, I mean, Liga MX basically pushed through some major changes. I mean, you know, the ex- expanded Liga, the expanded playoffs. So you know, now twelve of the eighteen teams are involved. And also, uh, you know, the suspension of promotion and relegation, I mean, really protecting the owners and saying, look, you know, owners are losing out big time here. Um, and so and so we're going to do everything we can to uh, to help them. So, um, so yeah, really, you know, th- this pandemic has, you know, I-, I think those changes were kind of there in the background previously, to be honest. I mean, I think that there were discussions about suspending promotion and relegation, but I think this pandemic has just kind of hit the accelerator. And, and you know, we're going to see, you know, this weekend now, very different kind of look with the playoffs with this kind of playoff with a play in round from you know teams from from fifth to twelfth. So um it's definitely gonna bring some drama though because you know how many leagues in the world you know heading into the end of the season would like to say you still got 12 teams that could that could potentially win the title. Yeah, absolutely. And for those who don't know Liga MX and not, you know, that familiar with it, they should know that, by the way, it's it's really two seasons in, in one. It's the apertura and the clausura. And the apertura is the beginning. Then you get that break and then the clausura, the beginning of the year. But to your point, Tom, let's talk about the playoffs for this one in the apertura. Leon, Pumas, Club America, Cruz Azul, they have that bye. So they're waiting. And now this weekend, just to give you that roundup, Santos La Una against Pachuca. Chivas against Necaxa, Tigres against Toluca, Monterrey against Puebla. And, you know, why don't you give me, I guess, very quickly from those games, which is the one that you're looking your eye on? I think it's, I think it's got to be Chivas and Necaxa. Um, I just think Tigres and Monterrey are heavy favorites. Like, you can't see them slipping up. Santos Laguna and Pachuca is going to be interesting as well. There's very little between them. Santos, you think the home record is probably going to, you know, you probably put them favourite, but but Chivas against Necaxa is is really interesting because obviously Chivas a powerhouse. You know, this is a team that claims forty million fans in North America. I mean, you know, there's going to be a lot of eyes on them, but they've had such a kind of weird season. I mean, they finished seventh, um, you know, which is the first time they've made the top eight since 2017 Clausura with Matias Almeida and they won the title. So it's like the Chivas nation is kind of like, we're back in the playoffs, we're back in the playoffs. But then at the same time, off the field, it's just been a, it's, it's been a, just full of scandal. I mean, the players have been partying. They've been, one players have been kicked, one player's kicked out of the club. Three have been indefinitely suspended. Now you've got a couple of injuries. Alexis Vega's injured. Um, JJ Macias is injured. So oh. it's just, there's a lot of drama going on at Chivas. And it's just going to be interesting to see how Nakaxa, this team that, flip players basically every transfer window and seem to be there or thereabouts, you know, and they're coming into this with this, uh, this playoffs with, you know, five consecutive victories and going up against Chivas and the pressure that, that Chivas are under and, and, and the circumstances surrounding how, you know, there's just so many, so, so many issues off the field with Chivas that you wonder if that's going to, you know, have an effect on them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Chivas, just a giant of Mexican soccer, but with so many issues of the field. Listen, you, 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 we threw out a bunch of tweets to see if people had questions, and of course they do. They want your brain, Tommy. They want your brain. So let's break it down here. Uh, Leon, who won the regular season, uh, here's a question from Doc Martin. Uh, obviously, that's not his real name, but or maybe it is. I don't know. Maybe if it Le- is. <laughs> hopefully, <laughs> exactly. hopefully it is. <laughs> yeah, I, I really hope it is. But uh, Doc says, if Leon don't win at all, Tommy, how big of a choke would it be? He can't remember a team having played so clearly better than the rest in a long, long time. So they had a really good regular season. I guess to add to that question, Tommy, like why has that been the case? And can they continue it in Ligia? No, it's a great question. And, and listen, everybody out there, when Leon plays next week in the quarterfinals, that's the team to watch. Watch Leon. The football they play is absolutely superb. Um, and yeah, they, I mean, they've been, been the best team in Liga MX now for a couple of years. I mean, the style of play, possession based, it's, you know, the, the fluidity up front. Uh, Luis Montes, 34 years old, in the absolute form of his life, it's absolute joy to watch him control games. And I don't know, he's, he's you just, you just have to watch uh, Leon and the way they play. And, you know, Navarro, the fullback who, you know, he doesn't just come inside like Philip Lahm and kind of come into the midfield, but he actually goes diagonally and becomes like a number 10 or even a, even a striker. Um, so the, the, the system that they use is really interesting as well. And, and yeah, to answer the question, there is pressure. 
I mean, Nacho Ambriz has put together this absolutely amazing team. The record is sensational. You know, one loss all season. But this is the this is the reality of Mexican football is that there isn't any prize for winning the regular season. <laughs> it's all about lifting that trophy. And Leon, you know, if there is one kind of defect, and we saw it in the CONCAP Champions League um, just before all this kind of pandemic stuff came, where they won at home 2-0 two, two against LAFC, and then LAFC defeated them 3-0 up there in, in LA. And I mean, I I, honestly, I don't think LAFC got enough credit for that because that was a sensational win. But but yeah, that that's the that's the pressure that Club, Club Leon are under. But um, at the end of the day, for me, they have to go into this this kind of league year as the favourite. I mean, it is the team to watch, no doubt. What's the latest on uh, Angel Mena? Because he, you know, uh, five assists for the for the for the season, I believe he's a uh, you know most creative player for Leon. What what's it, would he is he the best player or is there who else is like a, such an influence for Leon? Yeah, I think Montes Chapito Montes uh, I mentioned there he's the absolute key. I think Yairo Moreno, the Colombian international left back, is arguably the best player in the league. To be honest, I mean, if you're going to pick one player from Liga MX and say look, I'm going to slot him in, in in a good La Liga team. Mm. Then I think Yairo Moreno is arguably, you know, that player. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, all over the field. But it's also the system. Like I said, the system is geared towards Angel Mena, mm. just getting the most out of him and getting him involved in as many one-on-ones as possible in the final third. So, um, so yeah, no, it's a, it's, a, it's a top, top team. Let me ask you, Tommy, uh, as we wrap up here, um, You know, Leon, the team to watch. Uh, what about players to watch? Because, you know, Andre Pierre Gignac, once again, I mean, this man will never stop, I think. Like, right? He's still scoring goals. But how how good, uh, You, we've talked briefly about Tigres. How do you see their chances? Yeah, no, Gignac, honestly, it almost feels like this little, this obviously the break from the pandemic has kind of fired him up even more. Like he's been, he's been absolutely on fire. He's been some at certain points in the season, kind of taking Tigres on his shoulders and, and carrying him forward. I mean, he, he's absolutely on it. You know, he's almost 35 now as well, but, um, but yeah, you can't Tigres, you can't rule him off. You know what you're going to get with them. Um, you know, there is a little problem in terms of when a team goes up there to Stadio Universitario and, and sits back, they find it a little bit difficult sometimes to break them down. And we've seen them kind of draw a couple of games that there's no way they should have drawn, like the last one in the regular season against Atlas. Um, but yeah, Tigres are there or thereabouts. In terms of other players, you know, you look at Club America and, um, you know, for, for Mexico fans as well, I think Sebastián Córdoba is, um, we saw him play in the international break for Mexico. This is a kid who maybe needs to find a little bit more consistency, but he's just got such a sweet left foot technically so gifted, versatile, and he's a, he's a player you want to see now. Uh, um, I think he's 23, 22, 23. You want to see him impact games. And, and this is the stage. The league is the stage. All of Mexico is going to be watching. A lot of people in the States are going to be watching. And, and I think this is a, a good moment for Cordoba to, to really step up. Let me ask you about Monterrey, because we haven't talked about them that much. Like, you know, they, they lost the last regular, the, the last game of Apertura uh, against Guadalajara, but, you know, they're entering the, the, the La Liguilla. Vincent Janssen is also in this squad, which is like super interesting. <laughs> How do you see them? Monterrey are weird. I mean, this is a team for me. If you look at, if you want to put it in MLS terms, you've, you've probably got six or seven designated players. I mean, this is a ridiculous squad. This is a squad for me that, that competes in in La Liga. Not saying obviously with Madrid and Barcelona and Atleti, but you know, I think mid table it would you know Monterrey would be there. I don't know the style of play. I think Turco Mohamed is kind of he's a little bit cautious. They play a lot on the transition, and I don't think it kind of sits with this kind of. They are a genuinely big club, um, but if they get it together, they're the reigning champion. You know, last season was was cancelled. Monterrey are currently actually the Liga MX champion, the CONCAF Champions League champion, and the the, the holder of the, the Copper MX. Interesting as well, I think Rogelio Funes Mori, the, the Monterrey striker, not had his best season. But it's kind of interesting because this is a guy who grew up in Texas. You know, he's, I think, born in Argentina, grew up in Texas. I think the US national team were kind of flirting with him when he was kind of a teenager up there in, I think, the Dallas area. But now, he's getting his papers through ready to play for Mexico. And he I pretty much guaranteed Tata Martino next year is going to call him up. So it's another name to watch, Rogelio Funes Mori. I think most people know him. Um, he watched Liga MX, but um, he's, a, he's a guy who, who, if he's hits form, then he can he can take Monterrey to another title. Absolutely no doubt. 
Oh my God, that's kind of amazing if he ends up playing for Mexico and then you have Raul Jimenez and then, oh, if he's not available or if you want to give 20 minutes or maybe to contest for that number nine, you go Funes Mori as well. That's incredible. All right, before I say goodbye to you, Tom, let me put you on the spot here. All right, we've talked about Leon, Tigres, Chivas. What's the final here? Who do you see taking it all? Do you think Leon has it enough to, to make it or is somebody else to surprise? I have to go with Leon, you know. You have to go with Leon. It's just the best team. Um, they've done it. You have to. You have to back the best team. You know. You look at Tigres and Monterrey and America, and you think either of those those three can win it, no problem. You know. We know Liga MX. There's there's quite a lot of parity, especially between the better teams. Uh, Cruz Azul, again, a top top squad. They've not won the title since '97. There's so much pressure when they get to that semi and the final that you know the the um, I don't know. It's difficult. And then outside of those, I think anything anything else would be a little bit of an upset, even Pumas, you know, they've only lost once in the regular season, but I don't know. I think they were punching against the above the weight. Sorry. Um, but maybe if you look in an outsider, I know it sounds a bit silly because Pumas finished second in the regular season, but maybe Pumas. And then I think, you know, Santos Laguna, I quite like, to be honest. Um, I think, I think Santos are, are kind of on the rope. Um, and I think they've got enough quality in the squad to cause anybody problems. And also with Santos, They've only lost one in 26 games at home. And so nobody wants to go up there to Torreon um, to, to face that team. That's a really, really good point. Listen, like we've said goodbye to Conmebol World Cup qualifiers. If you want sort of do or die football, like Liga <laughs> MX Liguilla is the one to watch. And it kicks off all of it this weekend. Tom Marshall, you can find him on Twitter, Mexico World Cup. He covers the Mexican national team, Liga MX. So much more. Tommy, so good to have you on the show. Thanks for joining us, bud. No, thanks for the invite, Luis Miguel. And uh, yeah, enjoy the, the weekend's football in action. Oh, I will. I want to thank my brother, Jimmy Conrad, and my special guest and friend, Tom Marshall, to help us low down on everything that's happening this week. And make sure that you follow us on Apple Podcasts and also on Twitter, Kegolasso Pod. And if you're listening to us, on cbsports.com, head over to Spotify, Stitcher, the aforementioned Apple podcast, and make sure you leave us a rating and review. We can't wait for this action to begin. We will see you next time to recap it all after the weekend. See you then.